Good afternoon, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to Thrive Talks. Hi, Riaz, how are you? While we let some of the others come in, um, let me check with how you're doing. Hi, hi, absolutely great. Uh, thanks, Shreyas. Great being here. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. And as I was, you know, we were speaking about yes, uh, just just before the call. I think your background is so fascinating and interesting for this hybrid world. Getting real about hybrid, which has been our focus yeah. for the Thrive Talks this season. Yeah. I think it it uh, brings out so many elements uh, uh, of hybrid. Probably if there was a picture uh, that would talk a thousand words for this. Okay, uh, I would say this would be the picture. Okay. Uh, no, picture. really. Yeah, it's a great metaphor for uh, so many yeah. things uh, yeah. for us to begin with. Um, anyway, let's get started with the conversation. People will keep joining in. Uh, welcome again, everyone, and welcome to Thrive Talks. As my, my name is Shreyasi Singh. I'm one of the founders of CEO, of, uh, one of the founders of Harappa and the company CEO. Thrive Talks is our forum to get into conversations with India's talent custodians, leading talent custodians. It's a conversation in a forum we began earlier this year because if the one thing the pandemic has done for professionals and companies, it is that it has put people and everything to do with people um, uh, front and center. And I think talent custodians and people custodians have become, I think, one of the most important um, uh, you know, senior leaders in a company just because of everything as human beings and companies. That, we've gone through and it has been a very, very exciting and enriched, um, enriching conversation for us to have. Obviously, at this season, we've been focusing about getting real about hybrid. And today, um, for the sort of the last uh, uh, episode of this season of getting real about hybrid, I'm delighted to have with us uh, Riaz Mullah from Tech Mahidra. I think Riaz doesn't need any introduction for people who are in India in the field of leadership and talent development with his stellar career of over 25 years at Tech Mahindra where he has developed leadership pipelines. It's a very interesting word that I've heard people use about him is to be a thinkfluencer. Um, and I think he's, um, uh, he's really somebody who's very intellectually interested in a lot of the conversations around uh, reflection, around psychology, around um, cognitive sciences, and certainly the art and science of learning, um, which is how we will contextualize this conversation um, to hybrid. So very delighted to have you, Riaz. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And just while you're talking about how people and people-centric things are becoming popular, uh, uh, the latest news of Lina Nair taking over. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you can just see how, how, how it's playing out. So I feel, uh, yeah, technology and uh, people, I think these are the two things that will uh, are going to define oh probably yeah that's again what technology and people there is exactly evocative <laughs> uh, very clear you know, either, right. either the ctos like parag uh, agarwal uh, of twitter or you have the chros like uh, lena nair okay so these are the new ceos of the world uh, that's true so everybody the cmos and the chief sales officers buck up because you have competition coming from other people in the functions and you're so right i think that's a really good way of looking at it is in terms of trends and themes emerging it is the understanding and enthusiasm for technology and it is the understanding and commitment to people that is really what is going to shape organizations right now so i think that's a really good um, and Veera Naya's news was just so exciting, um, uh, I, I think, to hear. So let's dive right in, Riyaz. The way Thrive Talks functions is essentially this is a 50 55 minute conversation that we will have and, and shop at five. We structure it in three themes of around 15 minutes each, and we take audience questions at the completion of each theme rather than packing it only at the end for the last five or seven minutes. Theme one, we're going to speak about cognitive flexibility. I think the one thing that I think all of us have been imposed on us, even if we didn't choose for it, then I think we will talk about cognitive flexibility for managers, because this, that's really where um, uh, you know a lot of churn is happening. And then, of course, I'm very, very interested as an author myself to understand your musings and around your book around lockdown lessons, which is something that you did over the last 15, 18 months. So to begin with cognitive flexibility, what does that word mean for you? And why is that word, why is that phrase and that skill or that competence such an important area for discussion right now for the world and the world of work? Yeah. So, 
So I think uh, uh, for me, let me first start by simplifying it, okay? Because when mm-hmm. I heard first the term, so we are all, uh, uh, it's an age of jargon, okay? Metaverse, you talked about think influence, uh, okay? Uh, cognitive flexibility, it makes everybody seem so learned, okay? Uh, uh, to me, it very simply means uh, having an and mindset. Okay, mm. uh, and I'll tell you why uh, that is so important and why that is probably so fundamental. So if you uh, look at the word hybrid, okay, uh, and that's where the, this whole theme started off uh, about hybrid. Okay, uh, I see that hybrid is actually a mega trend that is playing out. Okay, and if you say hybrid, it means amalgamation. Okay, very interesting etymology. If you go and read the etymology of that word. Okay, uh, but if you see. Uh, whether it is man machine as we saw out there whether you take the hybrid cars okay uh, or whether you take digital okay mm-hmm. digital in itself you take any of your apps for example that we use none of the apps can be done by a single technology and what is happening you see so while you may have cloud and you say that cloud is is the the is the is a trend now on technology first, but cloud in its own will not work if you do not have security the cyber security along with cloud okay mm-hmm. uh, or if you do not have uh, analytics so you may have cloud which will allow you to have a lot of data uh, because storage is no longer a concern but if you have a huge amount of data and don't have analytics it doesn't help you okay uh, i may want to do ai but if I am using AI, if I don't have integra- uh, uh, data with integrity, AI doesn't work. Okay, so none of these technologies can you can take a, a, a technology and create a complete application uh, within itself. So you need an amalgamation of technologies and integration of new technologies to come together. Okay, uh, so in every aspect, and, and the same thing you're seeing in industry. Okay, if you say, for example, take fintech. Okay. Uh, today, uh, uh, fintech uh, is, is all a mixture of finance, technology. Uh, I was talking, I, 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 the other day I was, uh, as I said, uh, uh, looking at an app, reading about an app, which is actually mm. a health app. So if you take mm. a Fitbit now, and which is now uh, becoming even wider, so it will not only just, now is not just a variable which uh, takes care and monitors your body parameters, uh, but it also will then uh, ensure if anything goes wrong, we'll have contacts of your daughter, contact your doctor, we'll book an appointment for you uh, at a hospital, we'll connect with your insurance agency to say that they are mm-hmm. connected with the hospital. All of this is now ha- slowly get, getting possible in this device. And I heard somewhere that while doing your daily jobs, now it even allows you to mine cryptocurrency. <laughs> now mining cryptocurrency. So while you're on job or walk, you can now do mining because cryptocurrency and uh, is the, is the latest uh, big thing that's coming up now imagine and health app what all it is doing mm. so industries are fusing in domains are fusing in okay technology is fusing in whether it is petrol and gas or electrical vehicles are fusing in learning is fusing man machine the the environment is becoming humans and bots everywhere hybrid uh, is becoming a mega trend so i see that as a mega trend and if you want to work and survive in this trend and adapt to this trend then having an or mindset saying this or that will no longer work okay uh, and to me very simply cognitive flexibility is being comfortable with both uh, petrol and electricity uh, knowing when to use what I think that's beautifully said. I think this it, it, to make a big jargon-filled word like cognitive flexibility and bring it to a simplicity of saying it's a mindset of and and not not a mindset of either or. You do, for example, very simple thing. You don't have an option to either work from home or work from office all the time. You have to do both, and both you will yeah. also have to work from the airport, and you're also yeah. working from anywhere. And and I think that's very germane for. The way people think about their careers and the people who are under your charge think about the career because now you're a salesperson in in manufacturing of i don't know auto supply goods plus then you go digital so you almost have to stack up keep stacking and a set of absolutely. skills experiences or abilities right yeah true absolutely true uh, so, and that's why it's not no longer work-life balance it's it cannot be work and life as two different things i do work or i live life it has to be work mm. and life 
Mm-hmm. And what has you, tell me personally, for, first for you, and then second for the people that are under your charge and they're learning under your charge. What have you found the most useful way of building and fostering this and culture? So to me, I think this first a matter of mindset and then skill set. Okay. Mm. The mindset would be, and the word out there is flexibility. Okay, mm, uh, mm. cognitive we add uh, just to make it fashionable and glamorous. Okay, the word to me there is flexibility. Okay, mm. so when you say flexibility, uh, you're a bit. So some of the skills that I feel, uh, and some of the mindsets I feel, uh, will come to skills later on. Okay, uh, that go with it will be first me being aware. Okay. Mm. Uh, of what are the various options and models that exist, okay? Uh, and me being aware that when I am interacting, and that is what work from home has made it, okay? See, I am doing this call with you now. Uh, I am at home, uh, and suddenly uh, my son will come from behind and say something, okay? Uh, now, here I am playing a different role when I am talking to my son, okay? Uh, I have to be a father, okay? I can't mm. talk to him like a trainer. Okay, mm. uh, and then uh, something else is happening. So roles are fusing in in work from home. Uh, all roles are fusing. In. Earlier our environments were different. When I was in office, there was very little disturbance. I had. at the most I would receive a call from my son. I would give him some direction that that transaction closed. Okay, now now it's all like that. So me being aware at this moment what role I am playing. Okay. Uh, is probably uh, so awareness at various levels, right? From starting from what role I am playing uh, in a particular transaction, and then once I'm aware, then I can be true to that role. Otherwise, the problems are happening. Is I shed that, uh, and that happens. You know, it's happened so many times. Uh, I finish my day's work whenever it finishes. I start talking to my son, and many times my son comes or my wife tells me, uh, "You're no longer a trainer here. Please don't give us lectures." <laughs> Now it's family, so they they will no leadership. Say, Gyan works at home, uh, uh, <laughs> and they will give feedback straight, direct. Okay, my team may not do that. Okay, my team may not do that. Uh, family may give me that feedback. My team may not do that. Okay, so one is, uh, uh, and that is why I feel the first and very very important skill is uh, awareness uh, and uh, knowing what role, the awareness, at least knowing what role you are playing at any given time. Then comes the flexibility of being able to shift from that. It's a very different skill in itself. But it first begins with, am I even aware uh, at any given time uh, of what role I'm playing so that I know uh, uh, how to interact, how to do that transaction. Now, understand, I think the, the point that you raised about awareness, of course, and awareness of many things, I think there's also an academic awareness of how the world is changing, industries are changing, all of that. And then this awareness of your own identity in every situation is very important. But the one thing that we haven't spoken enough of that I, I think you raised also is the environment and what it does to our ability to be flexible or not, right? And how much we need to be. Who are the kind of people, you know, you manage um, talent dev and leadership uh, skills for such a large organization you see generations of people coming in right how are you who are the people you've seen who have found it the easiest to become more and more flexible and what are the mindsets that stop the people from becoming flexible you know can you now tell is there a persona that you can tell um, this person will is likely to be more flexible and the other one has to be pushed more and will struggle to be flexible so I began uh, with a myth, uh, as many of us begin, that probably the youngsters uh, carry less baggage, okay, uh, and uh, thus would are probably uh, uh, more flexible, okay, uh, and yeah, it is true to a certain extent, but I find that it is only true to a certain extent. Okay? I have seen that uh, it spans; uh, uh, it doesn't have a really generational. Uh, Element to it. Element. I have yeah. seen that people who have a diverse set of interests mm. okay, mm. tend to be more flexible and more comfortable. Okay. So people who have dabbled in three or four things, okay, uh, I have found them that they find it comfortable 
to adapt to various scenarios uh, better than people who are probably experts in only a certain uh, certain uh, certain area or one one area experts yeah because for them uh, to uh, uh, to think that that could also be another perspective and it's not hmm. just about another perspective so that's very interesting it's not just about having another perspective it's being comfortable with a perspective which will be completely different from yours opposite hmm. to yours hmm. okay uh, so it cannot be that you only have long term planning or short term thinking you also need you have to be comfortable with long term planning and short term results hmm. okay hmm. and that is the hmm. challenge of and sometimes that and brings a conflict and you have to live with both long term strategy and short term results yeah that no it's called zero you can be fast and slow mm. you cannot mm. be that i am slow so i will give you results only after three quarters okay because slow is the new fast or, or somebody says like that okay <laughs> but at the same time there has to be some measurables which i can put from now and so so i have seen that uh, having a diversity of interests diversity of backgrounds that people come in uh, no matter what age or gender or nationality uh, etc that makes them uh, more open uh, also people who have uh, 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 who are very curious to learn and that's why learnability is going to be here. people who have curiosity okay so when there is a opinion that comes to me which is uh, not aligned to what i said so if somebody stands up and says no no uh, working from home is the best way uh, and so and then somebody says no no home we don't get social connect and all that it should be office okay uh, when people who operate from certainty uh, mm. are people who find who find it difficult okay uh, to be curious to say that why do you say that why do you say office only is important okay what makes you say that 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 curiosity that willingness to understand where the person is the other person is coming from that comes from uh, curiosity uh, i would say and even before curiosity it comes uh, with a uh, with and i'll probably want to uh, get time double click on empathy because empathy is such a uh, such a broad term you all use but let let us first stay to curio one uh, diversity of interest to and curiosity, curiosity. i think that there's a fascinating discussion that has been happening a lot on the deep generalist and the specialist which is what we're talking about diversity i think this is so this is so important even for recruiters and talent acquisition people at the workplace to I understand i think all discussions which are or are meaningless discussions yeah we need generalist and specialist and discussion which is all discussion is flawed a flawed in its own uh, i think that's a really good that. point it is really good point and what is for which role and what kind of company at what stage do you need how many deep generalists and how many deep specialists that's depends it. on that is the understanding that there's is. a fascinating book if you haven't read called range by david epstein oh that's and, good. Yeah, good. and 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 he actually talks about that and he takes the world of sports and says take mm-hmm. the example of a difference between federer who Let has played many sports many yeah. sports and tennis yeah. right yeah. like your and as yeah. opposed to sort of specialists like the tiger woods who have played golf from 3 and said yeah. the model for being successful now is to try you know people who have children or even with for our for our teams the thing is to give them expose them to diverse Worst experiences it. and what's called wicked problems it's a fascinating yeah. book on this conversation about I'll, flexibility I'll called that on my reading list yeah. called range and the other thing that you were saying that i wanted to comment on is you're so right you none of us have the luxury and i think professionals and teams and organizations each other, none of us have the luxury to a luxury to choose a side and just stick to it to yeah. say we'll only be slow or we'll only be fast you have to be deliberate and uh, and um, spontaneous both right both. and it's called zizo zoom in and zoom yeah. out right zoom you're, you're supposed yeah. to be able to yeah. zoom in zoom out uh, we have some questions already coming from the audience sure. let me take a, a few as we gosh we're already at the end of team 1 i think a very interesting question and so true for indian workplaces and companies right is this hybrid concept of hybrid uh, marisa is asking it in the context of hybrid work but i am going to expand it to hybrid in general um when a lot of the ands are fusing together right 
does it disturb status quo in a strongly hierarchical organization? And what does it do to um, hierarchy? I think uh, hierarchies, uh, if there are certain things which are sort of almost definitely going to go away, uh, is hierarchy. But let me say hierarchy, what about hierarchy? Probably this command control part of mm. hierarchy will go away. We still need certain elements of hierarchy which are essential, which is uh, the decision making aspect. Decision making becomes faster in hierarchy. Okay. Uh, mm. So if you are in a war, okay, you need quick decisions. Okay. Uh, but in general, if you take broadly, uh, every business is becoming a platform business. Everything is becoming a platform, everything becoming a service on a platform. That's how everything is operating. Even people in COVID times are talking about oxygen as a service. Okay. And you have a platform mm. on which you get oxygen. So you're talking to me, mm. you're about everything mm. is becoming a service delivered on a platform, which essentially is about bringing suppliers uh, and the consumers together. And that's why uh, the one shift that has to happen is moving from uh, a hierarchical to a more connected network. Okay. So what I say is the question that you should now be asking is not what I control, but what I am connecting. Mm. And, and who I am connecting. And businesses which ask what is it I am connecting vis-a-vis -vis what am I. So in hierarchical, the whole philosophy is about what am I controlling. Whether you take people, whether you take supply chain. The question to be asked in the world that we are moving into is about what I'm connecting. And that's the shift uh, that is needed. Though there are certain elements of hierarchy uh, which are still needed. If you are in a war, uh, then you still need uh, command and control. You can't go with uh, uh, a platform, uh, 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 a very uh, connected uh, decision making if you are in war. In war, you still need command and control. But other than but that goes to your that goes to your earlier point about awareness. Your most of us are not at war. Hopefully, all the time, even at work, right? There are moments of this peace time. There's we war unfortunately time. Unfortunately, use war. a lot of war terminology in business. But if you are continuously at war, then you are going to kill your one day. Your either you or your people are going to get killed. Definitely. But uh, last question on this theme before we take this to flexibility for managers, and there are a couple of questions on that also from the audience. Is how. How can you force or not force, facilitate and foster this awareness of where somebody is on their flexibility quotient, right? Um, for organizations, that's one of the questions. How do you do this for your people? Yeah, I, 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 that, that's a very good, uh, very important. And probably what we started off first, okay, uh, like uh, most organizations did with in terms of sessions on mindfulness, uh, relaxation, and we did a lot of sessions on mindfulness, etc. Uh, eventually, what we are seeing worked well was uh, mm. we started this concept known as a leadership retreat, okay? where we get uh, people in, uh, and this is a physical uh, coming together of people, okay? where what we have realized is that people in the last uh, 18 months or so have not had an opportunity to really share or vent completely. Since most of us have been operating within a confines of our homes and with the same set of people, okay, there is only so much you can share with the same set of people. Okay, when you meet and go out and meet different set of people, a lot of varied sharing that happens. So there's a lot of things that are inside. And even if you're connecting with your official colleagues, your managers, you have all those virtual connect sessions, they are still nowhere not, the sharing doesn't happen. To the extent that happens so so we get them into a retreat and we started off with an emptying out session mm. and that goes wow. to two two and a half hours three hours to the extent that we have seen that generally we've seen that after about two two and a half hours people get tired and they realize that now they are empty okay and they don't want to then afterwards share okay but we allow that to happen and once that has happened only then we get into uh, discussions about uh, what are the various themes that are emerging? What are some of the skills that they are doing? How are they reacting into the situation? So I think this, we have, and then we realize that we can't do it face to face, but then we realize that it's also possible to do it virtually. So we use uh, tools like idea boards, etc. Uh, and we are finding that it, it works fairly well in the virtual world also. But one of the things that we realize that most of our programs, leadership programs that we begin with now, 
uh, we design a session where we get people to express whatever is there uh, mm. that they have to express. Mm. And once that has happened, we have seen that then they become ready to receive inputs uh, and then to start focusing and reflecting. Till that time, to expect them to reflect, uh, 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 we have seen that that doesn't work, especially post pandemic. So that's one thing that has been our learning. I think that's beautiful. Just recapping that emptying out session, I think, is a great one. So just from you know some lessons from Riaz, um, from the first theme, I think this language of and it's a very simple change, but it is a very powerful shift, right? And the language of and I think is one that the second the conversation on emptying out, I think, is a very very powerful conversation. How we are sort of deliberately trying to do that, um, and this awareness as a mindset about you know who you are and. Uh, what you need to be in this situation and you can't choose to be an either or but you will have to adapt to i think are some of the big themes that you've said around uh flexibility and uh, for that to lead to cognitive flexibility as we change to sort of the next theme and focus on cognitive flexibility for managers because with so many people issues i think there are organizational policies but really all of this and you mentioned empathy as a word which you wanted to double click on and let's double click on it here i think managers have really it become the front line of all of these ideas being manifested for a team member or an employee right and there now managers are being called to they deal, they're human beings dealing with their own issues and going through exactly the same universal churn that we're all going through and then have to demonstrate empathy have to demonstrate the and be connected and not controlling right what have what has been your experience as you watch managers being able to you know, become more flexible managers. Yeah. So, uh, see, uh, we went through this, as I said, it's been a journey of about a year or so. Okay. And we started with manager sensitization sessions, every five sessions with psychologists. Mm. Ultimately, we realized that when it comes down at an atomic level, there are only two or three skills. So, empathy again is not a skill. Empathy is Again, we found is an outcome of certain behaviors that we do. Okay. So, mm. how do I demonstrate empathy? Okay. Ultimately, we find it came down to two things. One thing, of course, is awareness we spoke about. And then it's about asking questions and listening. Mm. And even if you double click on curiosity, it's about asking questions and listening. And we realize that these two are actually the key meta skills that are needed for management. And that is the reason how we came out to emptying is a manager is also filled up. Okay. And he's mm. probably managing a lot more stress than the associates. So till we don't listen to the manager, to expect the manager to start listening is very difficult. And that's where, that's how we came down to this, uh, to this emptying out session is uh, this was for the managers. We first allowed the managers to express themselves. Once they have been expressed and listened to, and they realized how they felt, we simply asked them, how would it feel if you now listen to your teams? And then they get it. Okay. Then it is no longer cognitive. And that's why I, I, I don't very much like the word cognitive. Okay. Because it keeps it only to the mind. And if I know listening skill and listening techniques, and I go to another training and listen and go through another three techniques of questioning, Till I haven't experienced listening myself, I don't know. And all of them felt they were very good listeners. Mm. Okay. Uh, till they realized what listening was. Okay. Uh, and that, that's why I think for managers, uh, these two skills now are becoming uh, life skills, fundamental skills. Is mm. How do I listen? And how do I ask those key questions uh, that will help me then uncover? Because... Uh, in a face-to-face -face meeting, when you're meeting people face-to-face, -face, you end up talking and you end up making, uh, 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 discussing so many things in a virtual world. And especially, it's, it's not just about virtual. I think it's also about one thing that we have discovered and one feedback we have got from all our managers across the business is that mm. life has become extremely transactional. Mm. It's about closing one transaction, going to the next, closing that transaction, going to the next. Even at home, it is the same thing. I have to pay my son's fees. I have to pay this bill. My, my son is online. I have to decide now which tool for him. Uh, so everything is becoming transactional. That is what managers across businesses are telling. Now, in a transactional world, 
uh, I it's it's not I neither listen nor I ask women questions. It's just about closing this, moving to the next, closing that, moving to the next, going that, moving to the next. How do you to even to get into asking questions and listening? I need to learn to pause. Okay. Mm. One mm. of the feedbacks we got from, from uh, our managers very interestingly is that this one technique of taking a five minute break. And we are not saying a five minute gap, but taking a five minute break between call one to call two. They have said that it has made their call so effective. Otherwise, it was just closing this immediately going to the next. And they have not even shifted their mind. They are still, the earlier call is probably my team, the next call with my customer. I am, it's very difficult to shift. But this five minute of pause technique. I mean, it looked for us, didn't look very, diff uh, at that time, didn't, we didn't realize how important it would be. But very interestingly, when our managers are given feedback, they have come back saying that this five minute pause technique between calls is actually helping them more than uh, a lot of uh, other cognitive stuff that we shared with them. A lot of techniques and models and frameworks. Uh, this five minute pause is, because they are managers, so they know their stuff. Oh, God, I think that is such a powerful tip and everybody can do it. Whatever size of the organization you are, you can do it for yourself. You can do it for your teams and you can do it for the organization. It's end calls five minutes before the hour on uh, at 30 minutes and start the uh, other one after five. So people have that. I think that's such a simple technique. And I love the way that you describe demonstration of empathy, which is ask questions and listen, because you're right. It's such a big word, right? Um, that it's very difficult to say, but yeah, what is empathy? I'm interested in knowing about you. And when I do ask, can you tell me I have the patience and the commitment to listen, right? The follow-up question from this though about asking questions and listening and this emptying out also, I think from a manager perspective, we ask, where does one draw the line? I mean, the question that I'm thinking more and more of because people are ready when you do ask and when you do listen, people actually tell you a lot, much more than you had expected them to. And obviously, where is the balance and what is the social contract in terms of privacy? And what is the information that a manager can legitimately be expected to handle about issues that are happening in people's personal life? How do you see that play out as you've asked managers to, you know, get to empty themselves out and ask others to empty themselves? Where is this line? Uh, it's it's a it's a difficult uh, one to know where exactly the line. Uh, I can only mm. share from our experience. I think what is important for managers or the managers of managers leaders to know is that when you do this emptying out, mm. there is going to be a lot of negativity that is coming going to come up, and it's very important that we become comfortable with that negativity. Mm. We have many times we have seen where things go wrong is the moment somebody comes up, the leader starts giving suggestions uh, and improvement areas and uh, tools and tips. Actually, people many times know that they don't want that. They first just want the world to know what they have gone through in the last 18, 19 months, how they are managing, how life has been difficult, how they have been treated fairly or unfairly by the organization, by their so I think being comfortable uh, listening to some amount of negativity is very important. Our experience has been is that after a certain stage, the people themselves realize that how much negative they can. <laughs> and once you reach that threshold, we have seen that the penny starts to drop. Hmm. Now that threshold may vary. As I said, when we do a physical session, we have seen that two hours. Uh, by the end of two hours, they themselves said, uh, bho hai negativity. Uh, let's shift the topic. Bado, we said, well, let's shift the topic, which is fine. Well, what we have seen is uh, in the virtual world, we use uh, tools are there like idea boards, etc. And there are other tools as well. I'm sure there are, that is what our teams. Uh, and getting people to write it down becomes a little bit easier. If you ask mm. people to talk, uh, especially in a virtual, it, it, it goes on because you can't moderate. You don't want to stop them in between when they are in that uh, flow. Uh, so when you ask people to speak, it becomes difficult. Uh, we have realized that when you ask them to put it on a post-it note and start putting it, then they mm. crystallize it. Mm. 
okay mm. uh, the, so mm. while it helps expression uh, it also helps to crystallize it at the same time uh, it also reduces the time okay because you can't tell stories when you are writing okay uh, you are crisp uh, so we have seen that uh, that works well okay uh, and after two, one or two uh, such questions about uh, their environment impact uh, they are they are willing they are ready to move ahead okay uh, then you, then it's your opportunity to then take them to where you want them I but think that's I think, again very uh, useful tips. Tools is a good, yeah, yeah, I think very useful it. tips, very useful. Um, uh, I think tips for everybody uh, is to say be comfortable with some of the negative emotions that are coming. And I think writing as a tool for reflection, broad basing it and sharing sort of distilled thought. I think it is the best. I think people go on and on in something. I think when they actually want to share, it protects expression. It can it's also correct. protect uh, privacy. Yet it can yeah. distill the thought and. That sharing at one end, I think seeing a mood board with five hundred post-its, all yeah. same patterns and word clouds coming up, can be very very powerful to build a certain sense of kinship and that everybody's gone through. I'll tell you one one very interesting thing I found that it's so surprising that one of the facts that people felt very happy about is that they say, "Oh, there are fifty other people having the same problem same, I'm having." Exactly, exactly. And I, I was surprised to see that the kind of happiness that gives to people that oh i am not alone 30 other my colleagues are going to exactly the same they have exactly the same problem that i am having though it's i i found it very surprising i thought everybody should know that all are going through the same stress but just to know that there are 30 other people and we found that that has a magical impact then they feel oh i am not alone i am not alone no i think so and which you can see there's a sort of in when you crowdsource it and there are 50 posters together that becomes immediately evident uh, because i think the human experience is such a shared experience and so similar you know this point that you said about the negative i think that's a great um, um uh, i think anybody in positions of any influence who have people coming in and emptying themselves out to them have to become comfortable with negative emotions or uncomfortable emotions and Do I think, think this, uh, leaders means... have to be very careful about this whole thing about positivity, positivity, positivity. Okay, we are so positivity. positivity has been so drilled in that the moment somebody is negative, we become uncomfortable. So I think leaders have to be comfortable that positivity doesn't mean uh, that nobody can speak negative. Okay, I think that 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 positivity you have to get out of that uh, positivity syndrome or whatever you may call that. Yeah, I know that nobody can feel any negative emotion. But as a question yeah. to this, I'm going to ask, does it also mean for managers, especially leaders, and this is I'm saying more senior managers or managers or managers as you call them, to not feel like they have to always be in knight in shining armor. That just because somebody's telling you a problem doesn't mean that they actually, as you said, they just need you to listen sometimes. It doesn't mean that every negative emotion they expect you to address. And then sometimes in a rush to address, address poorly. Do you think there's also been more sort of, you know, humility around being a manager of manager, a senior leader to say, listen, all I can do is hold your hand and listen. I actually can't solve this for you and nobody can. We all have to live through this. Do you think that sort of slight humility is also a change? Well, in I, think that, I think fantastic. And uh, thanks for bringing that. Up. I, in fact, I was reading Harvard research, uh, mm. recent engagement. And it says that what people now want to hear is not success stories of their leaders. They want to know where their leader is failing. They mm. want to know what wrong decisions their leader has made and how she or he has tried to correct. That is what it is. So a leader going out and saying that uh, I can hear and let me tell you, I am also going through some of these challenges myself. Okay, uh, And this is where I have been able to succeed. This is where I am still struggling. The kind of connect and engagement that will bring will be way, way different, okay, uh, than a leader going out and providing answers. Okay, so going out there and providing answers uh, is probably, uh, and to be honest, uh, today nobody has all the answers. Okay? Nobody has answers. Uh, my boss, my boss yesterday uh, in a call said that. Uh, I'm uh, in trying to solve these two ends of the spectrum and I'm trying to find an answer and let's hope uh, we get the right answer. I don't know what will be the right answer. That kind of, the connect that brings in is very different from the connect saying that we have done our research, we know what it is and this is how we are going to do it. Okay? Uh, I think the, that knight in the shining armor uh, persona uh, 
uh, has lost its sheen. No, I doesn't think make that's you so real true. and authentic. Yeah, doesn't make. But now bringing there's a question from the audience, right? I think which is linked to this point. That as we become as leaders and managers of managers and managers become more human, more vulnerable, share more. Right? things become so flexible. Actually, we don't understand how many trends are afoot and so much sociologically and psychologically, so much is changing in the way that we interact with each other at work. How do you, and we talked about this a little bit between command centers and things like that, how does one draw the line between flexibility and organizational culture? Because hierarchy is easy to not defend and whatever the command, but organizational culture, this sort of, you know, um, how does one do that when there are just so many more perspectives and authentic points of view there, with none of which are wrong or right? So one thing I think is, first of all, uh, have you got one is uh, as an organization do you have a culture statement okay mm. uh, and is the culture statement all in compass for example uh, we about uh, two three years back uh, uh, unfortunately even before the pandemic uh, uh, defined our culture statement which says that uh, 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 we drive positive change celebrate uh, uh, each moment and enable people to rise very interestingly, uh, one of the auditors told us that uh, they found what very interesting in our culture statement was this focus on celebration as a culture. Mm. Mm. So I think I one that. is, do you have a defined culture statement? Is it broad enough? Does it appeal uh, to people? And then how you demonstrate that culture uh, in terms of action? Because you may have a, a beautiful culture statement saying celebrate each moment. Okay. Uh, but if you're catching people on the for every failure and uh, ensuring that uh, uh, they get uh, yeah, and you're only rewarding success, okay, uh, then you're building a different culture. Mm. Whereas if you're rewarding performance, if you're rewarding effort and celebrating an effort put, then you're building a different culture. So what you demonstrate uh, is going to be important, and I think uh, uh, and that's why it's. Uh, it's such a it's a huge thing. I mean, we can have uh, a, a day session on culture, and still it would not suffice. Okay, everybody's finding. But I think it's very simple. Uh, the way we did it is number one, having a culture statement. Number two, knowing what are your non-negotiables. Mm -hmm. So posh is a non-negotiable for us. Ethics is a non-negotiable for us. Besides that, everything can be flexible. Mm. Because mm. in a in a in a and culture you need to have flexibility, but at the same time you need to know what are your non-negotiables and what are the things which is not negotiable. Success or failure is for us negotiable. You may try something and fail. That's fine. We can go back and try something. That's okay. But posh non-negotiable, ethics non-negotiable, no flexibility there. So you need to also know one your culture to your non-negotiables, and, and that is the approach we are taking. And I think you're so right that as things become more flexible, and if that is the reality, it's time to relook your organizational culture to say that what is it that you're saying and what are your non-negotiables which you are not flexible on and build whatever. But do you think it will that connectedness point, right? Because culture sometimes, and it can't culture, I agree with you, can't be a laundry list of great sounding attributes that everybody has customer centricity, also, everybody has innovation. Also, that is essentially what it becomes a laundry laundry okay. list of uh perfect values, right? And perfect attributes. It's time to maybe strip that down to the two or three things that are non-negotiable. But still, even if you do that, Riaz, the fact is that culture was a binding force while a company is together, right? And in that, flexibility will not, if not endanger it, but change that quality of unison um, a little bit because a manager or a manager of manager could be flexible in one way. Another team could be in another way. So I'm sure at some point it will create interesting new positive Absolutely. as well as possibly problematic situations as we go ahead in this more flexible world before we get, we're able to navigate it. And I think uh, uh, one of the things uh, about cognitive physics is also being able to uh, live with some amount of chaos okay, mm. and constructive mm. chaos. Okay? Uh, because yes, everything can't be in order because if you have uh, everything is defined by rules. And I think that's where organizations are trying to find a balance. Okay. 
uh, and you'll have to find your own balance and and it's a process of discovery right okay uh, so uh, so discovery i heard this term which i found very fascinating i'm trying to learn is that planning now has to be db discovery based planning you can't have a plan and mm. then operate okay mm. uh, yeah. you discover something and modify you discover something and modify so i think discovery uh, uh, and yes there will be some amount of chaos uh, uh, some amount of conflict that you will have to live with uh, but see how you can make it more constructive uh, rather than more destructive but yeah i think yeah. Those, those, i don't I, i don't have any yeah and no and i think the, that. again I again that. the first thing before we move to now the last thing and i know the only one mm-hmm. thing is i think what is going to be important and that's where again uh, very fundamental things for organizations uh, to do is how do you create a learning culture hmm hmm how do you create a culture because discovery is basically learning right when you say discovery is learning is i find something i learn something out of it i change something happens something works something doesn't work i find what is not working i change okay i learn and i change so i think this culture of learning is uh, is an absolute uh, must uh, in surviving in this yeah and just to close this out i think getting it back to what you said earlier about awareness as well say for example i think 2022 is going to be the year of discovery to say how flexibility meets organization culture how flexibility meets hierarchy how people how connectedness means command i think those are things we we'll discover so it's a year of again of discovery as if this way of working continues i mean the new ways of working are melding together i think we have to be prepared that it will be chaotic right and it will not be and i think the we can't short change the yeah, process in the time discovery yeah to expect anything else discovery. is foolishness yeah to expect yeah. anything else is uh, only to uh, get more trouble for yourself yeah this perfect neatness is not going to happen for the next several years i think given the way the world has changed of work has changed and i think to be prepared that it will not seem congruent all the time and cohesive all the time but it is uh the reality last 13 14 minutes and um uh you know we've completely run out is around you were talking about learnability and learnings and i know that you've written this fascinating book called lockdown lessons on your learnings during the last 18 months just tell us a little bit first about that and what was a kernel of learning that led you to write lockdown lessons yeah, yeah. no i think uh, uh, a very interesting story very shortly so I always uh, had this uh, for the last few years. I always uh, had this desire to meditate. Okay, and I used to meditate, but I had heard through a friend of mine of this uh, early morning meditation, the Brahma Muhurt. If you heard about that, okay. Uh, so I always wanted to Brahma Muhurt, but I my office is about twenty five kilometers from where I stay in Mumbai, uh, and you have to travel every day and all that. So it was just fair not possible to wake up at four thirty and then have that kind of a, a work schedule. it was not happening so when the lockdown happened okay and it was initially supposed to be only for 20 days or so okay uh, and it was suddenly uh, strange at that time uh, working from home completely i mean you used to do one day or two day work from home but never never entire working from home so i said oh this is good three weeks i can uh, where i can wake up early now because uh, i have uh, some flexibility on my time uh, so i started that day when i woke up at 4:30 i did the the meditation and once i finished that entire process i felt this compelling need to write something okay. mm. uh, so i wrote uh, uh, a, a, a few paragraphs okay it was about starting something new and all that and i don't know what came out to me i sent it out to the entire leadership okay i normally would not do that but i sent it out to my entire uh, leadership cadre and uh, very interestingly my uh, boss uh, replied back to me okay uh, cp himself wrote back saying that uh, these are the few things that he would uh, my ceo wrote back saying these are the few things mm. he would want to do uh, mm. and then that uh, triggered a lot more responses okay interestingly uh, that day was uh, ugadi okay mm. uh, and if you look at uh, ugadi in sanskrit it's a sanskrit word a combination of yuga and adi yuga means uh, uh, is a uh, is a age okay adi is beginning so it's a beginning of an age okay and i found that very strange uh, a strange uh, omen there okay uh, and then there's become a practice next day again i woke up early i meditated i found this compelling need to write so i wrote down again a few blogs and i started to uh, a few paragraphs about uh, a small micro blog that continued for 40 days because the lockdown con- went extended uh, uh, this practice continued for 40 days and after that it became uh, the, not daily but fairly frequent 
uh, and, and I was doing this, uh, but I never had an intent. And one day when I was chatting with one of our senior presidents, and uh, he said in one of the chats that, you know, I, I read your lockdown lessons uh, mm. every day and, uh, and they are very good, very inspiring. And, and that gave me an idea and that gave me the title of the book, Lockdown Lessons. And I said, why not put it all together and publish it as a book? Uh, and that is how uh, the book happened. So that's, that's, that's what it is. Uh, I just used to wake up every morning, whatever came I wrote. Uh, and I just put it raw and edited as it came. So that's how the book happened. And you, when you, you and I had spoken last week about your book a little bit, I think you had said something very interesting, which I was listening to a podcast on my flight from Delhi to Bombay day before with Katie Milkman is this American psychologist. I think she's at the, uh, at the Wharton School um, at University of Pennsylvania and very celebrated, one of those rising stars of psychology. And she has something, a phenomena that she calls the fresh start effects, right? That they've mm. started to see that, you know, good ideas, but when is the best time to start doing something new? And she said that's why birthdays, anniversaries, the beginning of a new year, the beginning of a quarter, whatever, right? These fresh starts that we have to look for. And there is a motivational difference when you give it that ritual. And you had spoken about how the book was organic in the sense, little activities, right? This incrementalism, yeah. little activities mm-hmm. became a book. So t- talk to me a little bit about these little moments and of incrementalism that you now believe in because of how the book has come about. Yeah, so, so what I have seen that happening, and thanks for bringing that to my awareness, is that very interestingly, I have seen uh, very small miracles and some big ones, uh, mm. small and big miracles happening over the year. Okay, uh, I always uh, uh, wanted to uh, uh, when I was uh, when I did my advanced gestalt about three years back, 2018. Okay, uh, and uh, that was in Pattaya. I had gone to Pattaya to do that training, and I, my trainer was sitting behind a particular background, and I, I so loved that ambience that year. I clicked the photo and I said, one day I'll do that. Okay. Mm. I talked about this leadership retreat and I was doing this retreat and somebody clicked the photo. When I saw that photo of the retreat, it was exactly similar to what uh, happened in Pattaya. And the training also was exactly the same. And I, when I saw that photo, I realized, oh my God, this is exactly the dream I had uh, that time. Okay. Uh, and uh, forget that, even in day to day life, there are so many uh, small miracles that are happening. Okay. Just that we put in so many conditions around that, that we are not able to see it. And what I have uh, uh, realized is that as you start dropping those conditions mm. that you have put for mm. yourself, okay, mm. you start dropping those opinions that you have about people, you start dropping those judgments, okay, uh, then you begin to see the miracle. Mm. That's there for you happening, okay. Uh, and then it's beautiful. And and as I said, it just one thing leads to another. So so it's been a journey of trying to. Uh, and let me probably uh, let this talk go down in history. So the book, <laughs> <laughs> the book that I am planning, and this is the first time I'm actually sharing uh, now. Okay, uh, is uh, uh, I'm uh, the book that I am uh, planning to start writing is uh, my experiments with becoming empty. Mm, and I have wow. seen that as you start dropping uh, your opinions, your judgments, um, uh, your fears, your conditions, uh, uh, a lot of things start opening up for you. And for the last one year, ever since I've uh, gone through that book, those 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 things are uh, those things have been opening up. Okay, whether you talk about the Think Influencer Award or uh, and so many such things have happened. I mean, I can count them. Uh, a lot of those things. I think this is, you know, just as we're finishing the year, and I think a lot of people will be in resolution making mode uh, in the beginning of the year. I think this thing, and as as an entrepreneur, and, and, you know, the entrepreneurship literature is all about big, hairy, audacious goals and BHAGs and bags and things like that. But I think what we've seen, even as a learning institution, Harappa, and the joy of online learning essentially is obviously that you get so much learner data and learner analytics. We've seen one of the tips that I certainly give people who want to learn new skills is be a little bit kind to yourself. Set achievable targets, set small targets before you immediately, you can't run a a, a 43 kilometer, a full marathon in two months. Run 10 days 
in the first month and run two and a half kilometers or you know eat right three days a week rather than eating right or seven days a week i think there's a little bit i like the approach of the squat this kindness in being able to let yourself achieve small things or small miracles and not just have these audacious ambitious goals which certainly as business people we are often prompted to or yeah. feel like we are expected to right yeah. and and even for the teams who work with us set them on paths of success yeah. because the little bit of dopamine hits and the mental stimulation that comes from achieving several small targets and yeah. small yeah. wins yeah. consistently is very powerful yeah very powerful uh, i i th- i absolutely agree with you i think uh, that's 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 uh, that's very well said uh, and uh, and you will realize one day that automatically the big things are happening okay mm. Mm. Uh, i have seen that uh, and i have seen uh, how the big things have just happened okay uh, once you uh, are open to this daily uh, daily goals daily activities uh, so we we are, we love to set long rewards knowing the purpose having a vision i think that is important very very necessary that you have a broad vision a big vision uh, but you need to know what you need to do today uh, you need to know what you do, need to do now the doing yeah. is in the now okay that's important the doing is in the now there's a question from the i think it's a very I, but because you're a learning custodian let me take that although it's a slightly different uh, kind of question that's coming from the audience about digital learning and learning management system and virtual training replacing physical trainings i know it's a uh, sort of a tem uh, tem sentiment shift in the kind of conversation we are having but i'd like you to take it but take yeah. it from the view of all of we've talked about some very profound skills whether it's awareness whether it's empathy whether it's curiosity right now think about your role as a learning designer learning solution thinker for the organization how are you managing for such big skills as well um digital and and physical or hybrid so so, so our approach uh, has been uh, on that is we need to create a learning ecosystem Mm. and i think this ecosystem thing is important because there is not going to be a single partner there is not going to be a single skill there is not going to be a single tool okay uh, which is going to solve all the problems or all the skills which is help you going to build all the skills that are needed the skills that are needed today the 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 styles with which people will learn to are learning today they are also diverse the skills are so diverse that if you do not invest in building a learning ecosystem you will struggle to do that and that's been our mm. approach okay mm. uh, is uh, creating a learning ecosystem uh, it takes time but i think ecosystem thinking uh, whether it is in terms of content whether it is in terms of pedagogy whether it is in terms of uh, uh, the tools uh, whether it is in terms of processes policies uh, devices i think all of that uh, requires an ecosystem so i would uh, my simple thing is Uh, design uh, decide who are your ecosystem partners uh, and start creating an ecosystem if you try to do it yourself uh, you will never be able to meet this is your and philosophy you will this need and philosophy digital and physical you in will action. need you will need functional skills and behavioral skills you will need short courses and long programs you, you need an assessment partner you need a coaching and partner and a, and a coaching partner and a content and partner and a technology so, partner yeah and a content yeah. partner all of that because one person doing everything you will find uh, uh, almost not 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 possible let me end with this one last question that you have where is your confidence in terms of organizations as we've all gone through so much being able to have such evolved views in terms of learnability and understanding what true learn scaling learnability will take this ecosystem approach have you seen a quality um uh, a difference in quality of conversations that you're having with other learning custodians and large employers in india that you know there's much more about this understanding that this is how it will work this ecosystem approach yeah i think i'm i'm fairly confident that is how it will happen because it is inevitable to me uh, that is inevitable uh, and i think covid has only helped uh, while our journey started off about 3 years uh, ago almost a year a year and a half before covid Uh, it helped us adapt to covid much easier and much faster but i think post covid anybody who has not been on the journey and only talking about it uh, has realized that they have to be on that journey so i see this uh, i am very confident and 
earlier it was limited to only technology companies uh, but now i see that uh, even mainstream com man other kind of industries whether it's manufacturing uh, or uh, or some of the other uh, industries uh, everybody is adapting to that so i'm fairly confident that uh, uh, we will uh, that it will be a, a industry wide phenomenon very soon if it is not already Sure, and Riaz, close this for us by giving us your one hope and aspiration for twenty twenty two. What would be your hope and aspiration? So my hope and aspiration, uh, my aspiration uh, remains uh, the same to be uh, as empty as I can. Okay, mm. uh, it's a journey. That's why it's called as the experiments with becoming empty. I, uh, it's not easy. It's not. It's very difficult. Uh, at least for me, it's been a challenge. But I'm trying to do uh, be there. Okay. Uh, so that is my aspiration. My aspiration is uh, how do we put in an ecosystem uh, in place that uh, that is sustainable. Again, why ecosystem is because uh, uh, things have to work uh, even if you are not there. Okay, hmm. Uh, hmm. and and in fact for the learning function, uh, how how you are become uh, sort of uh, uh, how do you become not there for the organization? For the organization, mm. they don't need to go to a to a learning function. For them, uh, how do you make uh, so the the process of learning as automatic as the process of breathing? Okay, uh, I should be able to learn whenever I want because time is of essence. So I say this is one hour where you need to come. Very few people will come to a session. Okay, how do I make it available so that people can learn? Okay, uh, very automatically from life event. So these are some of our dreams. Um, uh, they are not easy targets, but yeah. Uh, they are ambitions. They, these are audacious. That learning audacious. Uh, also. You Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Riaz. Thank you so much for sharing um, some uh, fascinating perspectives and some very easy, doable. I think that five-minute break is a winner idea. Yeah. Everyone can do. Thank you, everyone, for I joining want to us. I close with uh, one chapter from my book, if you don't mind. Oh, of course, of course. Okay. Of course. Uh, I talked about uh, the and uh, the flexibility and all that. The one other skill which is very important, along with flexibility, is the ability to integrate multiple perspectives. Okay? Mm. It is all about integrating. Finally, when you have multiple perspectives, uh, the team is diverse, but finally, it's one team. And and this skill of integration, I feel, is going to be a very very critical skill. Okay, so I'll close with a very small chapter. Okay. Uh, that came on integration. I, I wrote it on one day. Uh, it starts with uh, saying that. Someone asked me, "Do you practice what you write?" So I wrote a lot of things, and then people asked me, "You write so many things, but do you really practice?" practice. And that morning when I sat, this thing came to me. So someone asked me, "Do you practice what you write?" Doubt is good, and so is surrender. You need to integrate both. Can you surrender with your doubts? Can you have courage with your fears? Can you know? that there will be unknowns and learn to live with both because you can't take one pole away from a magnet do i practice what i write i do and i don't when i collapse both polarities i become that I is beautiful that. thank you Beautiful uh, way to close. Thank you so much, Riaz. Lovely having you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for another session of Tribe Talk. Bye. Thank we'll you. close the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.